Ms. Lynch, you may present the prosecution closing argument. Yes, Your Honor. May I again inquire as to the time remaining? Prosecution, <coughs> five minutes, 48 seconds remaining on closing. Thank you. May I proceed? In this case, we have two charges, human trafficking and false imprisonment. As in any criminal trial, these two charges must be proven following a specific set of instructions, a specific recipe. And despite what the defense may say, we have the recipe. We have the ingredients. We have the facts in this case, Your Honor. And the facts in this case prove that the defendant, Cameron Aubrey, is guilty of human trafficking and false imprisonment. Beginning with human trafficking. The first element of human trafficking requires that the defendant deprive someone of their personal liberty through fear, fraud, or duress. In this case, all three of those are present. During Lynn Stark's employment at Taste of Tantara, the defendant would often yell at Ms. Stark. She would get up close with her. She would threaten to fire her. Based on these actions and statements by the defendant, whether she meant them to be intimidating or not, Ms. Stark did fear the defendant. Also, at the beginning of Ms. Stark's employment, she was told that she would be working a full-time job. Now, a full-time job, Your Honor, means 40-hour work weeks. But that is not what Ms. Stark got from this job. She got 90-hour work weeks with a fraction of minimum wage. She was also told that the defendant would do what she could to bring her family to the United States. But none of these things were realized. The defendant never brought Lynn Stark's family to the United States. She did not supply her with the job that was advertised. And because of this, Lynn Stark was deceived by the defendant. Also, there is evidence that Lynn Stark was under duress from the defendant. When Lynn Stark was hired, the defendant took Ms. Stark's visa and passport and refused to return them when asked. This means that the defendant had control over Ms. Stark for the entirety of her employment at Taste of Tantara. Therefore, Lynn Stark feared the defendant, was deceived from the, by the defendant, and was under duress from the defendant. This satisfies that the defendant deprived Lynn Stark of her personal liberty. Moving on to the second element of human trafficking. It requires that the defendant intended to obtain forced labor from someone. In this case, it was Ms. Stark. It's very simple that she wanted forced labor. She worked, Lynn Stark, from dawn to dusk every day for about four months. Also, when hiring a chef for Taste of Tantara, she said to Julian Blake that she knew that a lot could be gotten out of foreign workers for very little. This was implying that she could hire a foreign worker and abuse them. Also, she stated to Officer West, when Officer West confronted her with the truth about her treatment of Ms. Stark, she stated to the officer that everything under the roof of Taste of Tantara was hers. This was talking about Ms. Stark. Moving on to false imprisonment. It requires that the defendant confine someone against their will. And on the night of March 9th, after an argument with the defendant, Ms. Stark walked through the self-locking door, which the defendant then slammed on her. Not on accident, on purpose. And this act very clearly confined Ms. Stark to her room. And without a key, Ms. Stark had no way of getting out. Finally, we come to the second element of false imprisonment. This element requires that the defendant's act forced Ms. Stark to remain in her room. Now, it is rumored that Ms. Stark still had the key, but she did not. 
The defendant took this key. Miss Stark did not take this key because she was downstairs working in the restaurant. The defendant took Miss Stark's key while she was gone, the only time that she ever went into Miss Stark's apartment. This means that her act left Miss Stark without a key and without a way to leave her apartment. So there you have it. The people successfully brought to the table every element, every ingredient of human trafficking and false imprisonment. We have proved beyond a reasonable doubt that Miss Aubrey is guilty of both charges. And the defense may point to the defendant's character in this case. But if we have satisfied the ingredients, the facts for human trafficking and false imprisonment, that is enough. And therefore, the people respectfully request a verdict of guilty on both counts. Thank you. May I proceed? You may. The United States of America, a place of promise and opportunity, with a mix of ambition and capitalist competition, a cultural melting pot of people pursuing the American dream, a curious yet congruous amalgam. But as we all may know, some recipes work while others are destined to fail. And placing Lynn Stark, an anxiety-ridden, desperate, and inexperienced immigrant in a fast-paced restaurant environment was a recipe for disaster. A disaster that now causes Cameron Aubrey to sit here wrongfully accused of crimes pertaining to Lynn. But as the evidence demonstrated today, the only thing my client is guilty of is providing the ill-equipped Lynn Stark with an opportunity to pursue the American dream. Your Honor, the prosecution charged my client with both human trafficking and false imprisonment. They must prove both of these charges to you beyond a reasonable doubt. Over the next few minutes, I'm going to explain to you how the prosecution has come far from meeting this heavy burden of proof. Turning to human trafficking, the first element is defined as substantial and sustained restriction of a person's liberty through means such as fear, coercion, and duress. According to Calcrim 1243, all circumstances in, in determining this, all circumstances are relevant. So, let's look at those circumstances. Karen Aubrey placed an advertisement looking for a chef who must be willing and able to work hard in a fast-paced environment. Your Honor, Lynn Stark saw this ad and willingly accepted a stressful job. While the pay was not high, Cameron had disclosed to Lynn that she was unaware how much she could afford to pay her. In addition, tonight we heard that Cameron provided Lynn with housing, toiletries, and food. Sure, the apartment was not the Ritz-Carlton, but as Frankie Lyman testified, it seemed comfortable. Frankie Lyman also testified that Cameron treated Lynn more like a family member than an employee. Furthermore, today we heard that Lynn had access to a key to the stairwell door. So, Lynn, if she wanted to go out at night, could have easily done so. Why didn't she? Well, I was standing right about here when Miss Stark provided the answer to that question on cross-examination. There was nowhere to go in that isolated neighborhood. Therefore, Your Honor, any decision to stay in the apartment was a choice made by Lynn herself. Today, we also heard testimony from Addison Frey about how Lynn's ailments were not consistent with those of a human trafficking victim. Now, as Mr. Santos, my colleague, mentioned at the beginning of this trial, the prosecution has attempted to sway you to accept that Lynn's ailments were a product of the working conditions at Taste of Tantara. However, tonight, Ms. Stark herself admitted that her family back in Tantara added to her stress. And while Dana Grayjoy, the prosecution expert, opined that Lynn did fit the profile of a human trafficking victim, Dana Grayjoy did not give many relevant factors the same weight as others. Furthermore, Addison Frey provided testimony about how at Cameron's attitude did not reflect that of a human trafficker, whereas Dana Grayjoy provided no evidence, no testimony about Cameron's attitude because Grayjoy did not even interview Cameron Aubrey. Although Mr. Frey's conclusions are far more reliable, Your Honor, the very fact that these two experts have differing conclusions alone creates reasonable doubt. In any event, the prosecution has not proven the first element of human trafficking beyond a reasonable doubt, and thus my client must be found not guilty of human trafficking. But let's look at the second element, which provides when the defendant acted, she intended to obtain or maintain forced labor or services 
through means such as fraud, coercion, duress, or equivalent conduct that would reasonably overbear the will of a person. As Mr. Santos told you to look out for in the beginning of this trial, the prosecution's argument lacks evidence regarding Cameron's intent. And to support this element, the prosecution heavily relies on Cameron's actions with regard to Lynn's passport. However, tonight we heard Cameron Aubrey herself testify that she would have given Lynn her documents back if she would have simply asked for them, and that she had Lynn's passport to sponsor her visa. In addition, Devin Tyler testified that Cameron asked Devin a few times about how to handle this visa. With the busyness of the restaurant, Cameron did not accomplish this yet, but Officer West testified to finding these documents lying in a file folder right on top of Cameron's desk, in an office that was in close proximity to where Lynn worked many hours a day. In fact, Lynn was allowed to go in this office to call her family back in Tantara. If the defendant was really trying to keep these documents from Lynn, would she have them sitting right on top of her desk where Lynn might happen to stumble across them? Moreover, the prosecution's argument can be traced to the biased testimony of Julian Blake. And Officer West, who had taken a training course on human trafficking and observed Cameron and Lynn interact on many occasions, did not open a formal investigation until after the the bitter Julian Blake vengefully went to the police station. Moving further, the prosecution charged my client with false imprisonment, which entails that when the, def the defendant intentionally and unlawfully restrained, detained, or confined a person. However, it is undisputed that Lynn had an access to a key to the stairwell door. So, this whole charge comes down to one night, March 9th. Admittedly, Cameron shut the stairwell door because she was exhausted and upset, but Cameron knew Lynn had a key. Now, the prosecution desperately and speculatively contends that Cameron stole Lynn's key. But here's the problem. The prosecution's uncorroborated theory is that Cameron stole Lynn's key before Lynn made her vacation request. Cameron didn't know she was going to get into an argument with Lynn later that night. So the people actually want this court to believe that Cameron could see into the future. That, Your Honor, defies reality. My client, Cameron Aubrey, is not guilty of human trafficking or false imprisonment. For all these reasons, Your Honor, the defense respectfully asks that you find Cameron Aubrey not guilty. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Rockford. Uh, one minute for rebuttal. May I proceed, Your Honor? You may. Your Honor, the defense has implied that because Ms. Stark's documents were in the office in close proximity to Lynn Stark's working place, that Lynn Stark might have had access to them. But in this case, Your Honor, Lynn Stark is not the criminal. She would not steal something that someone else possessed. The criminal in this case is the defendant. And the defendant had a recipe for disaster in this case, not Lynn Stark. Lynn Stark wasn't a part of that recipe until the defendant made Lynn Stark a part of that recipe. Whether it was Lynn Stark or someone else, a hard worker or not, an inexperienced chef or an immigrant. Human trafficking and false imprisonment are inherently recipes for disaster. And due to the actions of the defendant, the people again respectfully request two verdicts of guilty. Thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Rutherford, one minute for rebuttal. Yes, Your Honor. <coughs> the availability of, these doc of Lynn's documents to her is not the point that the defense is focusing on. The point the defense is focusing on is Cameron's intent. If Cameron intended to confiscate these documents from Lynn, she would not have them lying conspicuously right on top of her desk in an office that Lynn would be allowed to go into. And also, previously articulated by the defense is the lack of intent, uh, regard the lack of Cameron's intent. Throughout this trial, we heard evidence of Cameron yelling at employees. But, Your Honor, if Cameron's actions in yelling at employees can be deemed as human trafficking, then employers all across this country would be guilty of human trafficking, Your Honor. Moreover, for every piece of evidence the prosecution has brought up tonight, there's more than one reasonable interpretation, one pointing to guilt and one pointing to innocence. According to Calcrim 224, if there are more than one reasonable interpretations to a piece of evidence, this court must accept the one pointing to innocence. That 